Um, all right, so magic systems. This is kind of one of my things, um, if you didn't know. So we're going to do a whole little uh, lesson on developing interesting magic systems because all of this stuff is great and you should be doing all of this but when it comes to your fantasy and science fiction books you're going to have some supernatural and or hyper scientific um, thing going on and these rules are the same whether it's science fiction or fantasy depending on your science fiction uh, they, they may fade out a little bit but these are storytelling rules not necessarily um, necessarily uh, just fantastical rules of that It'll make sense as I talk about it. Uh, I came up with this concept when I was on my very first uh, panel at a Worldcon. It was Chicago or Den. It was um, that place that's not Chicago or Denver. Those are both Worldcons. Um, it was that place in the that happens where Harvard is. Boston. Oh, Boston. <laughs> Boston in the fall. Um, <laughs> It, it, and it was in the fall. Um, so I have been to Boston in the fall. Um, so it was in Boston. That's a VeggieTales song. So um, It was in Boston, and I was on a panel. It was my first panel ever as a published writer. My book wasn't out yet, but I had sold one. They put me on a panel. It was a panel called How Does the Magic Work? And I thought, well, this is pretty awesome. I'm going to have a lot to say on this one. My first panel, it's going to be great. And so the moderator um, starts the panel and says, okay. Let's just start with just a generic question. How does the magic work? So Nate Taylor on the panel. Brandon, we'll go to you first. And I said, well, magic should have rules. And the other three panelists all looked at me and said, what? No, no, don't tell people the rules of your magic. Don't put them in your books. That ruins the book. And then I proceeded to have an hour of being beat up on <laughs> by three angry um, paranormal romance um, and um, authors who thought that rules in their fantasy ruined it. Um, and um, I came out of that panel limping and thought, I thought that was rule number one. Orson Scott Card told me that was rule number one in How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy, which is a great book, by the way. Um, fantasy should have rules. And um, then I realized, what are the rules for Tolkien's magic system? And I thought for a little while, and I thought, well, I could come up, um, come up with some for the ring, but for what Gandalf does, yeah, there's really only one rule, be Gandalf. <laughs> and I can't take the ring, Frodo, because the world would end. I'll just trust you, Gandalf. Okay. Um, and I started to understand, um, at least in, in my perspective, I started to see Magic is kind of a, a, as a sliding scale between wonder um, and plot device. This is kind of a weaker way to say it. I've got another word there, but let me explain. Um, the idea is that the more that your reader understood the magic, the more a part of the plot really the magic could become, but the less of a sense of wonder you had about that magic, if that makes um, sense. Um, and I started to start to feel um, that uh, I, I boiled this down to kind of a saying to myself, which I, um, out of pure humility, named Sanderson's first law. Um, so Sanderson's first law is that your ability to solve problems with magic in a satisfying way this is the subset I added later on. Depends directly on how well, look, I'm writing the whole thing out. The reader understands. All right. So, you really solve problems with magic in a satisfying way. It depends directly on how well the reader understands said magic. What that means is you've got really a sliding scale between sense of wonder and problem solving. And this scale is how satisfying it is to solve problems. magic. There's not two eyes in that. So, um, what that means is, if you want to have a 
beautiful sense of wonder to your magic and a sense that your characters are really powerless in the face of this awesome force, such as the gods in Greek mythology. Okay? Gods in Greek mythology are all the way over here. What can they do? Really whatever they want to. And your job is to stay out of their way. Um, and so they don't do weird things to you. You can curry favor with them. Um, and so you can kind of start to approach, you know, controlling it. But when you do that, usually something ter terrible and awful happens. And it's wondrous, okay? There's a lot of wonder to this because it's not something you can control. But also, when these stories are working, um, you're usually not solving problems <coughs> with that magic, and if you are, it's because a, the, the, the story establishes a few rules and moves it this way. And as you start giving the rules to the reader, you can then have the characters start manipulating those rules to solve their problems. Um, but you'll notice in Lord of the Rings, which is really kind of over here, um, Lord of the Rings, the magic usually does not solve problems. In fact, if the magic is used and it does solve a problem, it creates a bigger one. Okay? When Gandalf saves them, it's basically, Gandalf did this, but now he's gone. And so the, now we're lost in the world without him. There's this sense of, yes, cool things can happen. There's a lot of sense of wonder. But the problems aren't getting solved. They're really just being made bigger by, the, um, by the, uh, what's happening with the magic system. Um, occasionally, Gandalf will save them. I've mentioned in the, movie, um, the films why I like the ending of the second film, um, I believe, because it set up a plot structure. Um, where it said, did you, have you guys noticed this? Have I talked about this? The second and third Lord of the Rings films, this isn't in the books, but it's in the films. Um, I think the climax of the second film is way better than the climax of the third <laughs> film. Why? Well, it's all about what they're setting up and the rules of the storytelling. In the second film, the, the, in both films, there, you know, you've got this, this point where the, um, where the armies are outnumbered and locked in a fortress trying to defend, okay? Um, the second film, what happens? Who saves them? Yeah, no. And the third film, what happens? Who saves them? Aragorn. Aragorn. Okay. So in both, you basically got the same plot cycle happening. You're saved um, basically by someone external. Why it works in the second movie is what happens when Gandalf leaves. He says, look for me on the morning of the third day. What's happening here is he's setting up a rule for the magic. Peter Jackson is. <coughs> and the rule for the magic is, if you survive for three days, Gandalf will save you. All you need to do is hold out for three days, and the plot is not beat the orcs. The plot is survive for three days. And that's a different plot structure. One's a time bomb, one is, um, one is a different type of plot. Very different plot archetypes laid on the same exact things happening. When Gandalf shows up, it's like they, they've, um, they've forgotten, but then they remember, and the light comes, and they hear Gandalf's voice, and he rides down and saves them. And it's a beautiful, wonderful, powerful moment because you have been set up to expect, even if you forget it for a little while, that the, um, the, 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 the ending will be, will be saved by Gandalf when we survive third days, three days. In the third movie, he doesn't set this up very well. It, the, we aren't presented with... Now, of course, these are all great films, by the way. They are excellent films. But plot-wise, we've got this whole satisfying thing. Um, in the third film, we aren't really given the setup that if they survive long enough, Aragorn will save them. And we're just set up with this, we need to defeat the orcs now or we're dead. They fight, they fight, they fight. They can't win, and so Ga um, Aragorn shows up with the ghosts and saves them. And I felt a big letdown when that happened because I had felt that he, it was a deus ex machina. That's what we call this phrase. When a plot, um, a plot function out of nowhere saves the heroes at the end um, through no real effort of their own. Now granted, Aragorn went through a lot, and I think he was trying to show Aragorn had this great plot cycle where then he comes and saves him. But if you look at the time spent and the plots set up, I felt very let down, personally, for this, these reasons. And it was a, um, a, a concept here. Um, so really, Sanderson's first law is really a law of foreshadowing more than anything else. But if you, you think about it, you want to solve problems with your magic, explain that magic, okay? Um, or explain the, the parts of it and be consistent.
this works wonderfully well in a, um, a different genre, um, the superhero genre. We kind of have this sort of feeling between what we call hard magic systems and soft magic systems. This would be soft, and this would be hard. And superheroes, where are superheroes? Hard, and, hard or soft? soft? No, they're extremely hard. You've got to get through your mind here. What we're talking about is not how rational it is, how scientific it is. That is not what this means. This doesn't, what it means is how consistent is it? Now, those who read comic books are saying, uh, Brandon, comic books are not consistent. No, they're not. But um, within a given story, they tend to be very consistent. Um, except when they're making mistakes like giving to Superman the kiss of forgetfulness or something like that. But generally, what Superman can do, um, Superman's go a little soft, but let's, let's look at X-Men. What can Nightcrawler do? Everybody knows what Nightcrawler can do. They set up what Nightcrawler is capable of, and then he does it. Um, and when it's working, it works very well because he can do this one thing. And now we use it in interesting ways. Um, now, granted, they make lots of mistakes because I think they're trying to be hard. But then they, um, they just kind of whimsically make up new powers every once in a while because they aren't thinking about that. But those are, that's a hard system, making mistakes, not a soft system. A soft system doesn't intentionally not using it to solve problems, but using it to create a sense of wonder, okay? Um, and so something like Harry Potter is actually somewhat hard because she will introduce a rule into her books and then she will use that rule consistently through that book. And then she'll forget about it for the next one. <laughs> and that's kind of problematic also, but, um, but it is actually a hard <coughs> magic system. It's a little bit softer because she throws a lot of things in there just for sense of wonder that she doesn't intend to solve problems with. They're just there to be cool and give us a feeling of this world, and so that moves it this direction. But it's all about intentions of how you're solving problems, how consistent the magic system is, and how consistent you want it to be. Soft should not be a bad thing. If you look at it and say, oh, that didn't work, it's not because they're having a soft magic system. It's because they're trying to do a hard magic system and they're not giving you the rules. Or they're trying to do a soft magic system, but they explain it too much, so you kind of sort of lose that sense um, the, of, of mystical feel to the magic. Okay? So, that is Sanderson's first law. Really more of a guideline. Yes. Like, like you said, like for advanced technology. Advanced technology. Exactly technology. the same way. It needs to follow its own rules. Follow, follow its, its rules. rules. Yep. Um, introduce it. Um, now, keep in mind this high, whole satisfying thing. Uh, and you've got to ask yourself, how satisfying is, do I want this, um, this certain plot resolution to be? <laughs> A good example for this. Sorry, I'll step back over here. Well, I can't let both of you see um, unless I like, freeze right here. Um, a good example for this is oftentimes you will have in a story a plot archetype where the hero gets into big danger in like the first few chapters and then out, out, out comes riding up his good friend in the, nick of the in, the nick of, um, in the nick of time to save him, right? You've seen this before, I would assume dozens of times because I have. And what this plot cycle is doing is introducing the friend as a character. So the plot resolution will not be satisfying because a friend, oftentimes, that we, did, we as readers didn't know existed, saves them. But that can be okay because the plot resolution doesn't need to be satisfying because that little, that little um, vignette was not really about that plot. It's not about the main character you know, fighting, off these, um, fighting off these bandits. It's about let's introduce the friend in a cool way. Uh, I still think it's better to drop some hints that there's a friend out there that could come save them. and it'll, You'll get some more of that satisfying sense. But it's okay sometimes to just have this sort of thing happen out of nowhere in the early parts of your book. Because at that point, the reader is not reading for interesting or for you know, exciting plot resolutions of things they've followed for, for, um, for pages and pages. Where if you get to page 500 at the end of a book and there's something that's been, you know, the character's been working on forever and ever, and then they just develop a new power, um, at the end, it can be very, it can be a very big letdown. Um, that said, on the other side, and by the way, I say these rules, these are things I've developed over years to give these guidelines to myself. It doesn't mean I always do them right, or even that I always have done them right, because this is, these are things that I've kind of figured out as I've been going. So please don't say, Brandon, but you did, I, I've made mistakes. Or, it's sometimes I've decided that um, what I'm shooting for 
should violate one of these. But um, sometimes you want to leave some wiggle room in your magic. Um, that doesn't mean you explain everything on page one or even by the first half. But if you want to build a mystery plot that says, there is a hole in this magic system. If we can figure it out, we can solve this problem. That's like Gandalf showing up in three days. The magic solving the problem is, um, is okay when the plot archetype is set up as, we need to figure out how this magic works so that it can solve this problem for us. Then your plot archetype is the work here rather than the work over here. It's all about promises, expectations, and how you fulfill those. All right? What's that? Like the 12th panel. Right. Yes. Things like that exactly. Um, so keep that in mind. The 11th medal. Yeah.